Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we're going to be looking into five unique aspects of the Gordon Murray T50 that differentiate it from every other supercar on the market. Jumping right into it, number one and perhaps the most important is the design philosophy. Gordon Murray wanted to build the best driver's car, period. The formula is pretty simple. Lightweight, central driving position, naturally aspirated V12, manual transmission, and rear wheel drive. The formula sounds great, but it's actually a rather difficult thing to market. What are you going to brag about? The V12 is small and not all that powerful. The manual transmission seems pathetically slow in comparison to today's stupid fast dual clutch transmissions. People don't care nearly enough about weight, but they do care about horsepower, and 654 horsepower can be found in family sedans these days. When other companies are making new supercars, they're picking what they want it to be good at. The best track car, the quickest acceleration, the highest top speed. But these accolades only last for so long, and they don't even mean that the car is fun to drive. But they're bragging rights. When it comes to buying supercars, there's a lot of ego involved. Marketing teams obviously know this, so cars are flashy, exotic, and break records to make talking points. And while I certainly admire the engineering that goes into it, many of these exotics aren't all that special to drive. So why is this T50 good? Simply put, because it's fun. I've had the privilege to be able to drive hundreds of different cars, and from my experience, the amount of money you spend on a car doesn't determine how much fun you'll have driving it. And while the T50 is silly expensive, it says forget the records, we're building something rewarding to drive. It's not about ego, it's about having fun. And that's the edge it has over all the other supercars today. Number two is aerodynamics. Something super special about this car, which you've probably heard countless times, is that it can actually flap its wings very quickly and fly, fly away. Okay, that's a lie. But what is true is that like the McLaren F1 before it, this is a fan car. But this time, the fan is much, much more prominent. And here's the thing, it's fully functional and it's fully cool, but it's arguably a very insignificant portion of what makes this car great. To me, the big fan is the marketing stunt of this car. It brings in the eyeballs, and again, it's functional, but you'll notice the actual downforce figures aren't really talked about. I did a little bit of math, and the results are underwhelming. So it's underwhelming, but it's also very cool. So of course, Gordon Murray is famous for designing the fan car used in F1. And the design for that is pretty rudimentary. Basically, you have an engine powered fan at the back of the car, you have really low side skirts, and so it turns the car essentially into a vacuum cleaner. It's sucking itself down to the ground, creating a really low pressure underneath, high pressure on top, and so you have lots of downforce. You can go around a track very quickly. This is a bit more different of an idea. It's not looking to suck the car to the ground, rather it is altering how the boundary layer attaches to this diffuser. So there's a diffuser at the rear of the car and there are some slots, some valves in that diffuser and it uses the fan to control the boundary layer. So what this diffuser does is it rakes up and so it forces that air to move up with it, expanding back to atmospheric pressure and by doing so accelerating the flow under the car, decreasing pressure and creating downforce. Now the problem with the rake on the diffuser used in the T50 is that it's extremely steep and so the boundary layer doesn't stay attached. Instead it just creates turbulence within that diffuser. So what the fan does is there's these valves and the fan sucks that turbulent air out of that diffuser so that that boundary layer is controlled and you have the air move along that very steep rake of the diffuser and thus increase the actual useful downforce. Now there are six different modes for this electric fan and the one that creates the most downforce is braking mode. So in braking mode, it tilts the spoiler up to a 45 degree angle, really punching into that air. It accelerates the fan to a high speed and it opens up the diffuser valves to pull out that turbulent air and have that boundary layer connect with that highly raked differential. And so what this does is it doubles the downforce, which sounds extraordinary, right? Double the downforce, but we don't know how much downforce that is. And so we're going to do a little bit of math to kind of figure out an idea, a ballpark guess of what it could be, because they do provide that from 150 miles per hour, using this braking mode, this high downforce braking mode, they're able to decrease the stopping distance from 150 miles per hour down to zero by 10 meters. And 10 meters is certainly a lot. 
but 150 miles per hour is also a very high speed. So for example, let's say you have a car that can decelerate on average from 150 miles per hour down to zero at a rate of 1.35 Gs. And this is very good. So if you're able to decelerate at that rate, you would be able to come to a stop from 150 miles per hour down to zero in 500 57 feet. Now, using this brake mode, they're able to shave 10 meters off of that distance. So we subtract 33 feet, we're at 524 feet. So as you can see, the braking distance overall isn't that dramatic of a difference because we're stopping from such a high speed. So our deceleration rate here, to get back into units that we can all agree on, will be 1.43 Gs. So we're only increasing the maximum deceleration by 0.08 Gs. In other words, we're maybe adding, I mean, the car weighs about 2,200 pounds. Maybe we're adding 200 pounds of downforce by turning on, uh, you know, this braking mode. So it is meaningful, yes, but it's probably not nearly as significant uh, as the marketing statement that this fan has had, uh, you know, that it's a fan car and that it's so prominent of a feature there on the back of the vehicle. Now, one of the really cool things about it is a mode that it has called streamline and so it will tilt this spoiler down negative 10 degrees it will increase the fan speed and it will close off partially uh, these diffuser valves right here so you're mostly stalling that uh, diffuser and by doing so it basically extends the length of this uh, vehicle using like an air pocket behind it and accelerating that air from above the car to behind it. So in doing so, they're able to decrease drag by 12.5%, which of course is great for reaching high top speeds or getting excellent fuel economy. Probably the fuel economy they're going for there, not the top speeds, right? So a little bit of a marketing stunt, but at the same time, there actually is some usefulness to this. And also high downforce cars tend to have terrible ride quality because downforce increases with the square of speed. And so what that means is if you have a car with really high downforce at high speeds, its downforce is going to be so high. So it has to have a really high spring rate in order to support the vehicle. And in doing so, you still have to use that really high spring rate at low speed speeds. That's why, you know, there's some clever inventions like the Ford GT that has two separate springs that it can switch between uh, essentially uh, so that, you know, when you want that track mode, it's stiffly sprung with high downforce. And when you want to drive on the street, it's softly sprung. So this car, what it's doing is increasing downforce at low speeds, decreasing downforce at high speeds, giving you a more linear response not all that much of an increase in downforce. And as a result, you can use softer springs and the ride is better. Number three is weight. And this is really where the T50 just blows everything else out of the water. So, you know, looking at some popular cars here, Porsche 918, 3,602 pounds, McLaren P1, 3,400 pounds, LaFerrari, uh, you know, 3,500 pounds. The T50 is under a thousand kilograms, less than 2,200 pounds. I mean, it's absurd how lightweight this thing is. And the thing is, uh, there's a quote Gordon Murray said, which I really enjoyed. He said, if the car is light, you don't need a big engine. So you're probably looking at these cars and saying, but yeah, Jason, all of these cars have like 900 horsepower. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's why they're heavy. They've got so much power. And it's like, yeah, part of it is, but they don't need to have that much power if they were lighter. And uh, you can prove that point by looking at the weight to power ratio. So for the Porsche 918, there's 4.1 pounds per horsepower. For the McLaren P1, 3.8. For the LaFerrari, 3.7. And for Gordon Murray's T50, 3.3. So although it only has 650 horsepower, it has a significantly better power to weight ratio uh, than the Holy Trinity there. So a pretty, pretty amazing from a weight standpoint. The engine only weighing 178 kilograms. Uh, the carbon tub and all of the body panels combined, just 150 kilograms less than the engine. Pretty absurd. The transmission, 80.5 kilograms. So they've done an insanely good job on keeping the weight of this vehicle down. Now here's the tough question. Do cars need to be light? And from an engineering standpoint and from a marketing standpoint, I think the real answer is no. And that's the unfortunate answer, uh, but it's kind of the reality. Today's tires are so good uh, and cars like the Shelby GT500 prove that you can have an insane amount of weight and still have insane cornering, insane acceleration, insane braking. Um, so today's tires are very good and heavy cars uh, don't really, you know, show how how bulky they are because of such incredible you know suspension and tire tuning that goes into these vehicles. 
The, the thing that you can't really show about weight is that it's more fun. And if you go ride a go-kart, uh, you know, you realize that not having any weight, you're like, wait a minute, this is super fun. Everything is super responsive. It's very quick to act. And you can feel that, uh, but it's, it's a bit more challenging to quantify. Uh, and so there's, there's a playfulness that comes with lightweight cars that makes them really fun to drive. But that's a tough thing to market. Moving on to number four is the very special engine used in this car. So it's a 65 degree, four liter naturally aspirated V12. Now you may hear it referred to as a 3.9 liter. Uh, if you look at the actual displacement, it's 3.994. So this is absolutely a four liter engine. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not great at many engineering things. And I would say Gordon Murray is better than me at probably all of them except for rounding. I definitely beat him here on rounding because 3.994, that goes to four liter. That's a four liter engine. Regardless, 654 horsepower at 11,500 RPM, the most horsepower per liter in a naturally aspirated road going car today, 344 pound feet of torque at 9,000 RPM, and 71% of that torque is available at just 2,500 RPM. So even though it revs to 12,100 RPM, it still has torque at 2,500 RPM, which is pretty impressive, about 244, pound feet. The velocity of the piston, 25.7 meters per second. Very fast, not the fastest out there, but very fast. So why is naturally aspirated? Why is naturally aspirated the best? Well, I think there's three reasons. First of all, response. You don't have lag, things like turbos, which cause delay. And when you put the pedal down and when you actually get power. So naturally aspirated has insanely good response. It has insanely good control. So where your foot is on that throttle pedal determines how much power you're making, how much torque you're making. And it's not this weird sponginess like turbocharged cars get, uh, and even superchargers where you have bypass valves and you have to wait a little bit for that torque to come on. And then finally, sound. And this one's subjective, but are you really gonna argue that a naturally aspirated V12 doesn't sound good? I don't think you are. I mean, they just sound great, and you don't have turbochargers blocking that beautiful sound. Finally, number five, we get to the manual transmission. Yes, a $3 million car that's coming with a manual transmission. That is a beautiful thing. So I looked up, because I was curious, uh, what semi-exotic cars in the U.S. could you still get with a manual transmission? And only three popped up. Aston Martin Vantage, uh, a Lotus Evora GT, and a Porsche 911. That's about as exotic as you can get and still have a manual transmission. So that's sad. Everything's gone on to dual clutch. Uh, and actually, this wasn't going to have a manual transmission, but the customers told Gordon Murray, hey, we want a manual transmission. And so he did it. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Uh, so I'm not sure what the inside of the transmission looks like. I've kind of just made it up here, but essentially you have your engine. Uh, I'm saying the input bevel comes first, then you go through the gears one through six. That's number two right here. And then you have a final drive to go through before it goes to those rear wheels. So the gearing on this, uh, if you do the math based on the tire size and look at that, First gear is accelerating up to about 64 miles per hour. That's assuming that my layout's right and that you actually pass through the gearing the way I believe that you do. Uh, but 64 miles per hour in first gear, which normally I'd be like, hey, that's dumb. Why do we have such tall gearing? And I'll get into why I'm mildly okay with it on this. Uh, also, that's going to help them with their 0 to 60 and their 0 to 100 kilometer per hour. So I don't think they're oblivious to the fact that people care about 0 to 60, uh, hence first gear will accommodate that. Second gear up to 86, third to 115, and so on. The final top speed, he says, is probably going to be somewhere around 227 miles per hour. Now, why is it okay that first gear accelerates all the way to 64 miles per hour? Well, because I believe first, second, and third gear are all traction limited. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you have 344 pound-feet of torque at 9,000 RPM, and you multiply that by 1.688, and then you multiply that by second gear, which is 2.095, and then you multiply that by the final drive ratio, and then you divide by the radius of your tire, which is about 1.125 feet, you get 3,000 434 pounds of force that you are pushing this vehicle forward with. Now, the maximum force that this thing can actually accelerate with, assuming you could put all of the weight on those rear tires, a uh, load transfer under acceleration, will be some multiplier of its weight. So, you know, maybe 2,400 pounds or something like that. Versus this has 3,400 pound force available in second gear. So it's able to do wild burnouts uh, in second gear, starting in second gear from a stop. Um, and I believe it could even do that in third. 
It kind of will depend where you are in the RPM band, but essentially if you're traction limited in first, second, and third, uh, it's just kind of, they're just kind of fun gears at that point. It doesn't really matter which one you're in, but you can start off in first uh, and it won't be so ridiculous uh, as far as like the tall engagement. So first, second, and third probably can all spin the tires super easy. That's awesome. And as a result, I'm okay with the tall gearing there. How wild is this car? So it's just extremely cool and the design philosophy behind it is awesome. I love how clean it looks. I love the simplicity of it. Low weight, rear wheel drive, naturally aspirated V12, manual transmission. Uh, I do think the fan is mildly gimmicky uh, only because the effect that it has isn't all that extreme and you can see the overall clean appearance of the car and then you know they throw this massive fan on the end which I think looks cool. I do think it looks cool but you know from the design philosophy of let's keep everything simple and then all of a sudden there's this giant fan on the back it's like well that's not exactly simple that's a talking point that you're going to show to your friends and they kind of admit you know it has a test mode where you can have it flaunting its stuff and showing off to your friends so so it, it kind of is a marketing piece as much as it is an engineering piece the cool news is is that it's genuinely functional the fan does work to help decrease drag or increase downforce depending on what you're going for thank you all so much for watching if you have any questions or comments of course feel free to leave them below